Hello everyone, I'm Klaus Aranha from the University of Tsukuba and this is Experimental Science in Computer Science. This is topic 4, compare comparisons and in this video we are going to talk about comparison testing. So, um, in the last lecture we studied the new hypothesis method of statistical inference. In this method we determine two hypotheses, a new hypothesis and an alternate hypothesis which uh, describe different ways to see the population of interest. Using data from an experiment, we determined the likelihood that this data corresponds to either the new hypothesis or to the alternate hypothesis. Uh, that's a very powerful and useful statistic, but how we described it last class, we can only perform it to compare a single sample and an estimated mean. However, how should we proceed if we want to compare two samples from possibly different populations. So this happens very often, the comparison of two processes, uh, especially in uh, computer science uh, or in science, scientific experience in general. So sometimes we want to compare the efficacy of a drug against a placebo, or we want to compare the precision of one algorithm against another one, or we want to compare different uh, website design proposals. So in many cases we have two treatments that we want to compare. So we want to know what is the mean of option A, what's the mean of option B, and we want to know is the mean of option A bigger than the mean of option B. So that's a very common question. So how do we adapt the hypothesis testing procedure that we studied last class to this situation? This is what we call choose sample testing. So let's think about a simple experiment example. Imagine that we have a factory that produces steel rods, okay, for construction, for example. And we want, we have two processes to cut the rods, and we want a process that produces as small errors as possible. Of course, since this is a physical process, there is always an error. Sometimes the bar is a little bit bigger, sometimes the bar is a little bit smaller, and these errors, they cause cost. So we want to reduce this cost and we want to reduce the error. So we want to know which method uh, minimizes the error. How would we do this? One thing that is very important to observe about this experiment is what is the variable of interest. Can you think about that for a second? You need to be very careful because usually we go to the first thing that comes to your mind and maybe some of you think, okay, what we want to compare here is the size of the bar. But that's not quite correct. Remember, what we are interested in here is to minimize the variation of the bar. So we think, oh, maybe we want to calculate the variance which is closer, but we can do something a little bit better than that. We can try to estimate the uh, mean of the error. Okay, so we take the error of the production and we want to estimate the mean of this error. Now, let's see. We <clears throat> have two methods for cutting steel rods, old and new, and we want to figure out which one of has the smallest error. So now we have to consider the questions. How do we calculate the error? What is the observation in this case? And what is the sample in this case? And what is the variable that we're measuring? And finally, what is the statistical hypothesis? So pause the video a little bit and try to answer each of these questions before you continue. So how do we calculate and measure the cutting error? Since we uh, discussed before, the cutting error is the difference between the target length L and the actual length of the rod Xi. So that's size of Xi minus L. So if the cutting error is a property of the method, so the new method and the old method have different cutting errors, we have the mean cut cutting error that is expressed by this. So we want to, uh, to analyze the mean of the error, so mu e, okay, which is the, the this is the calculation of it. So, given that e x is an estimate of our cutting error, we can perform the statistical inference. So, for instance, 
we can using the statistical inference that we used last lecture we could do a hypothesis like this is the error of method y equal or under a value r so the new hypothesis would be e, uh, ei is less than r so it's less than our error and the alternate hypothesis is ei is bigger than r so bigger than our error now what if we wanted to compare two methods let's say y1 and y2 what would we do so when we have two methods we have to think about the model that represents that okay so Remember that each error for each method can be represented as a random variable. So the, me, the error of method 1 has a model that describes this error, and the error of method 2 has a model that describes this error as well. So we have two uh, populations uh, of the populations of error 1 and the populations of error 2. And let's assume for now that they follow a normal distribution. Now, one thing that is very good, uh, cool about normal distributions is that when we add two normal distributions together, we also have a normal distribution. So we can describe the difference between the errors as a random variable e diff, which is the e of the old method minus the e of the new method. And e diff is also a random variable under a normal distribution. So because e diff is also a variable from the normal distribution, we can use the same method that we used last week. Now we have the new hypothesis is e diff, the difference between the mean of the errors is zero, and alternate hypothesis is e diff, the difference between the mean of the errors is not zero. Think a little bit and try to see where we are going from here. What we did is that we took one error and we modeled as a normal random variable. We took the second error and we modeled a random variable as well from a normal distribution, and now we are comparing these two uh, these two estimators and we have an estimator that is the difference between the two that we want to compare so using this idea we can we can get a general statistical model to use when we want to test the two methods okay imagine that we have some value y that we are measuring okay so this is one observation this observation can come from one of several methods so y i i one two three so this i is the method okay so in this case we have two methods and of course we have several observations so we have this j each j is an observation okay each method has a mean each method i has a mean mu i and each method has an error as well that de deviates from that mean so which means that each observation y i j is composed of the mean of the method plus the error of that observation in particular. So this epsilon yj is the error of one observation in particular, and the mean mu i is the mean of one, er one method. So in this case, under this model, we assume that these residuals, they are independent. Okay, so this is the assumption of independence that we have been using so far. Assuming that these residuals are independent and that they follow a normal distribution, the population of the two samples will look like this. We have population 1 has a mu 1 and has a standard error. Population 2 has a mean 2 and will have its own error. So, um, what should be this variable y? Since the goal of this experiment is to, method, uh, to measure if the method proposes a steel rod, this case, the, the, uh, the variable that we're working with is the absolute error, as we mentioned before. So y is the L, the L of the variable, the L of the bar minus the target L, okay? And given the statistical model, we build uh, the hypothesis around the mean of the absolute error. In that case, we transform. So the new hypothesis is the difference of the means is zero. The alternate hypothesis, the means of the difference, is not zero. Or in equivalently, the new hypothesis is the mean of method 1 is equal to the mean of method 2, and the alternate hypothesis, the mean of method 1 is less than the mean of the method 2. Now, first let's do this that we have a variance that is unknown, but similar for both systems. So both systems have about the same variance. 
In that case, we estimate like we did uh, last time based on the variance from the sample. If they are similar, we can use the pooled uh, uh, variance estimator. I'm not going to derivate this, but this is how we calculate the variance of the two methods if we assume they are about the same from the uh, error of the observations. And given this value, we can now uh, calculate the t-statistic, which is very similar as we calculated in the last video. We have the difference of the two methods minus uh, the, the difference of the estimated means of the two methods minus the, the difference of the real means of the two methods divided by the error. And this will be equivalent uh, to the t-distribution with the number of observations minus two as the number of variables. Now, if we go back to our new hypothesis, we have that this, um, this factor, the difference of the means of the methods, is zero when the new hypothesis is true. So our t statistic under the new hypothesis will be the difference of the means, of the observed means, divided by the observed error. And this will be distributed following a t distribution. This means that we can reject the new hypothesis at the one minus alpha confidence if this t0, this statistic, is smaller than the, um, <clears throat> than the percentile of the t distribution under this number, these degrees of freedom. If you pay attention to this, compare this formula with the formula for the t-test in the lecture number three. Okay, you see that it's very diff very similar. Okay, both of them are very similar. Here we had the mean that we were comparing against. Here we had the observed mean. Now the mean that we're comparing against is a difference of zero. And the observed mean is the difference between the two samples that we are comparing. Also, we use a different error to take into account that we have two samples. But other than that, it's exactly the same idea of the t-test that we described in the last lecture. Now, if we remember the last lecture, we need to decide three parameters for the statistical test. The first is the significance level alpha, which is the probability of a type 1 error. We assume that the desired significance level for now is 0.05 for this experiment. And then the power, uh, that's the probability of a type 2 error. And let's assume for this exercise that we want 1 minus beta equals 0 0.8, 0 0.8 power. Finally, the, minimum differ the meaningful difference. What is the minimum difference between the two methods that we are interested in detecting? So let's assume that we are only interested in the new method if it has at least 15 centimeter less variance than the current method. Of course, these values need to be defined based on the experiment. Some experiments would need to be more precise. Some experiments would need to be more powerful. So you think, need to think about what is the necessity of your experiment. If you just say, oh, I will assume 0 0.95 without thinking about it, then you're not giving the necessary attention to your own experiment. So we calculated the statistic using the same t-test function that we used before. It's important to notice that when you use the t-test function, for this, you can use, for example, a table uh, that has in one column the error, the variable that you're measuring, and in the other column, a uh, symbolic variable with the process. And in R, you can use this nomenclature, length, error, tiled, process, to mean separate the, uh, the observations based on this column and use this column to calculate. So this is one thing that you can write in R. Or uh, you can add like two different uh, arrays with data if you want that. You can also have the alternative, like a one-sided one analysis or two-sided analysis. And here is how we specify that we are assuming that the variance of both of the process is true. Notice that here we got not only the p-value, but we also get automatically the, um, the confidence interval of our test. So this is the confidence interval of our test. And here it says that these are the estimates so for method A, we have an estimate mean of 7. Method B, we have an estimated mean of 15. One thing to note here is that for this example, we reject the new hypothesis. However, 
even though we reject the new hypothesis that method one has a smaller error than the second one, we see that our desired value is the, the difference between means is less than 15 centimeters. So it's actually not very um, um, meaningful. We rejected the, the new hypothesis, but even then, in this case, the difference is too small to really mean that, oh, we should use the new method. Okay, it's a significant difference, but not an important one. So this is the kind of thing, like significance difference doesn't always mean, yes, let's use this, okay? After we compare, after we do the experiment, it's very important to test the assumptions. So we need to check if there are no big uh, outliers in our data. We need to check if the data really follows a normal distribution. We need to check if the data is really independent, especially the independence and the outliers. If we don't observe this, we might have problems uh, in our uh, experience, in, in, in our analysis. Okay, so here the normality we do a here we do a visual analysis of the normality using the QQ plot, and also we do the Shapiro test, and it indicates that we don't see significant deviations of the normality assumption. But notice that the t test is quite robust to mute violations of normality. It, if it's a little bit no normal, that's fine, but you need to see your data to understand. Now, this is a little bit more important. We need to just check if the variance is the same. So we can do the Fligner test to test if the variances are the same or if they are different. Uh, the new hypothesis is that the variances are the same. The alternate hypothesis is that the variances are different. Also, we can do a chart where we plot the data of the new method in one side and then plot the data of the old method in the other side and if we can see if they are about the same distance from the center. Finally, independence assumption, as, as I mentioned in the last lecture, uh, there is no general test for the independence assumption. Uh, you have to guarantee it in the design phase of the experiment. Okay. Now, let's say that we cannot assume that the variance is the same. If we cannot assume that the variance is the same, we use the Welch t-test, which is a modification of the t-test, and you see that here we have the difference between the Welch t-test and the t-test that we saw in the, last in, the last, in the last example, is that here the estimated errors for each sample are proportional to the size of the sample. This also means that we, we cannot use different sample sizes for one sample and another sample to take into account a difference in variance. We're going to see a little bit more about this in the lecture that we talk about sample sizes, but here is something to keep in mind. If you're comparing two processes and one process has a much bigger variation than the other, you want a bigger sample, more observations in the process that has bigger variance. Okay. In terms of calculation, all that we need to do is to change uh, the variable in R that says if the variance is equal or not. And then we have the new test and the new results. So, to summarize this video, to compare an estimator from samples of two populations that follow a normal distribution, our statistic becomes the difference of the target variables. Okay, this, so this is a very simple target. So if you really think about it, so Klaus, you just subtracted the, the means and you use the t-test that does the same class. Yes, that's exactly what we did. We just subtracted the means and we use the t-test. Now, to just subtract the means and use the t-test, there are a few assumptions that we made. We made the assumption that the variances of the two are kind of the same, or if they're not the same, we use a different calculation. We also make the assumption that the observations are independent. And it's very important to see that the independence assumption can be broken in many different ways. In the next video, we're going to see a very important way in which the independent assumption is broken and how we deal with that. Okay. All right. So this is the end of the first video. I hope you have enjoyed and I see you in the next one. Bye bye.